Welcome to Season 8, Episode 20 of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be discussing Google Cardboard and catching up with Martin and Laura's Ubuntu phone adventure. We'll also have some gooey love and go through your feedback. I'm Joe, and joining me this week are Martin. Hello. Mark. Hello. And Laura. Hiya. <laughs> Classic. So, uh, what have you guys been up to <laughs> since last time we spoke all that long time ago? It's a whole week. Yeah, yeah. So much things have happened. Oh, so, okay. So, I've been playing with my new Garmin 220 watch. Oh, is this a smart watch? Mm. Uh, it's no, it's a sports watch. Oh. I was I was looking at the Vivo Active smartwatch because it's a smartwatch that does sports thing. But um, yeah, I got the two twenty instead because it's simpler <laughs> <laughs> and cheaper. What um, sports stuff does it do? It records your GPS dress, so then you can sync it to well, you can sync it to your software on your laptop if you're running Mac or Windows, or in my case, you sync it to an app on Android. Um, and it gives you stats and um, times, and you can hook up your heartbeat and things like that. And then sync it all to Strava and get achievements. So I ran too much and hurt my legs. <laughs> so is the weight of your new smartwatch slowing you down yet, or have you managed to PB using the uh, the new smartwatch? I got a PB about two weeks ago, 28.33. Woo-hoo! Wow, not bad. Not at bad at park all. Run. So, so yes. Joe, the Linux podcasting superhero, what have you been doing? Well, pretty much only other podcasts. That's the only thing of interest. So <laughs> I thought I'd use this as an opportunity to plug all my other podcasts. So here we go. Right. <sighs> First one, linuxluddites.com. Uh, that's the show where we try all the latest free and open source software and then decide that we like the old stuff better, <laughs> uh, which is fairly long running and fairly long form, much longer than this one. But do get... Is that... Oh- Sorry. Is that always the conclusion? Uh, mostly. Mostly. <laughs> Although uh, on the next one, there's going to be a shock revelation at the beginning that uh, something new is better than something old. So check that one out. The The other one I do is Mintcast, <laughs> mintcast.org, which is a podcast by the Linux Mint community for all users of Linux. So it's a little bit like this, only more Mint focused rather than Ubuntu, but still, you know, relevant to other Linux distros and the whole ecosystem. And then I've got my own personal podcast that no one listens to. So joeres.com, J-O-E-R-E-S-S dot com. Yeah, Martin's the only listener, I think, of that one. <laughs> well, and, and we'll I. Put them all in the <laughs> yeah. And that one, that's just random, basically. We just talk about news stories and whatever. It's, um, with my friend Isaac. Uh, it's, uh, he's a Linux user as well. So there's, uh, obviously that creeps in, but we try and just keep it as general as possible. Cool. cool. Martin? Ah, well, sad news in my house. My wife Mm. has a part-time job and she's brought home a new work laptop which runs Windows 8.1, which I have Mm. begrudgingly had to connect to the wireless network. (sighs) And this is the first... all right? This is the... Well, there's a couple of things about it. It's the first Windows computer we've had in the house for over 10 years. So (laughs) it's a sad day for me. And I was sort of Mm -hmm. glared at and said told not to say anything negative about it except this is a brand <laughs> this is a brand she new, knows you well then a, a brand new hp pavilion laptop and wow. oh my goodness how do people cope with windows it is so slow i mean it's just <laughs> it's just unbelievably slow everything it does takes seconds many many seconds to to perform the simplest of operations i just I, I, it's been such a long time since I've had da- daily interaction with Windows and I was somewhat shocked. But aside from that, let's get on to some more Linuxy stuff. I've been helping, uh, Victoria, uh, with some Pulse Audio routing. It's something I've not done before. And, uh, we So she's uh, doing our stings for these she's, shows. Yeah, while, uh, Victoria's. While Alan has whisked Samantha, Samantha away. away. On a, yeah. Yes. On a romantic <laughs> holiday for two somewhere. Yeah. So Victoria's <laughs> standing in doing the stings and, uh, I've, uh, in fact, I've had no involvement in this, uh, but the Mate team have put out the Mate 1.10, uh, bug fix point releases before we, uh, move into the Mate 1.11 development cycle. So, uh, those, uh, well, basically the whole stack got a slew of bug fixes, uh, in the last week, which is, um, which is great. It's uh, looking pretty tidy now. So. Mark, what have you been up to? Uh, well, I've been playing with Google Cardboard, but we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Yeah, it sounds like a show topic. <laughs> so 
So I got curious about a Google project. It's not really a product called Google Cardboard, which is a sort of 3D uh, VR, that is virtual reality case for your phone. And the way it works is they've basically published a specification for um, a cardboard box, essentially, which comes as a flat piece of cardboard with a couple of lenses in. Um, you assemble it yourself and you stick your phone in it and run an app which supports um, the sort of specification and it displays two pictures, one on each half of your screen um, and then you stick it up to your face and you get a sort of 3T headset experience. So I've been uh, I've been trying it out and I thought we'd talk a bit about it. How cool must it be if you were the developer who came up with this? Yeah, apparently it was done by a guy in like his, you know, they do like 20% innovation time. So mm. this was just one of those projects that he did, not as his job, but just as something on the side. So is it virtual reality or augmented reality or both of those things? Well, uh, it's interesting that you asked that, actually, because the way that the case is designed, it actually has a hole in what, when you hold it up to your face, is the front, which on some phones is where the camera is. So in theory, it could be um, it could be augmented reality, although the 3D effect wouldn't work so well because of the, um, unless you've got a 3D camera on your phone. Uh-huh. So most of the apps which are available are, focus on either um just 3d video or a sort of virtual reality experience okay so the the cardboard thing what yep. does that do to your eyes so do for your eyes do for your eyes so um basically you have uh it holds your your screen uh your phone about uh i think it's uh about an inch and a half four and a half centimeters away from your face mm-hmm. um and then the lenses in the box um and it is a box uh they basically focus your eyes on your screen um and it sort of splits it has it has a divider in the middle of your screen so that you get a discrete image to each eye and then your phone handles giving you the appropriate image for each eye so you get a 3d effect and then you can install an application like a a game or something one that i have actually tried i had my hands on this uh, a few months ago and one of them was uh, you kind of walking around in a forest looking at various things dinosaurs walking around and it, it when you move around it uses the accelerometer so it's not just yeah. a thick static image uh, another one i tried was on a roller coaster and you can kind of look left and right and up and yeah. down wow yeah so it does do it does a sort of head tracking thing um so you get um like, i mean there's various various things available like there's um the the demo app which they they developed has a, a tour guide thing where it, you're basically standing in various rooms with a person giving you a description of the room and you can just completely look around the room and everything in it um wow. there's also a, a 360 degree youtube channel where people have done 360 degree videos and you can basically be in the video looking around you um but uh, there is you know the the, the sort of there's always a bit of disorientation when you're first using it because while you you can see a 3D landscape around you, if you then walk forward, it will stay still. It doesn't obviously track your body at the same uh, time because you know that's a lot more advanced than a cardboard box would do. But yeah, it's interesting to see the interaction between your phone sensors and what is quite a simple, essentially cardboard case. Um, although it's worth noting that. Um, how well it works does kind of depend on the sensors in your phone so i've noticed that if you're watching uh if you're watching a 360 degree video um where you're trying to like to keep looking in one direction uh then you know, that only works if you're on like a swivel chair and you can adjust a bit because the sensors do tend to drift otherwise if you can only face one way you'll find that you're actually not looking at what you wanted to be looking at so this sounds like it should cost thousands of pounds, Mark. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not quite that good, I think. <laughs> it's probably why it doesn't cost thousands of pounds. I mean, um, and it's, it's, a cardboard it's, box. it's basically, yeah, it's a cardboard box. It's as good as the apps on your phone and as good as your phone is. Um, I mean, for example, um, you know, it's it's magnifying your screen, which means that if you've got a low resolution screen, 
you can see all of your pixels. So it's not exactly an entirely immersive experience. And I now understand why you get things like, or why why you might want a phone with something like a quad HD screen. I mean, my OnePlus One has a fairly high resolution screen, but it doesn't stop it being noticeable that I'm you know looking right at my phone. Um, and again, yeah, there's not a huge amount of apps on there. So, um, and most of them you have to buy on top of this. So it's not like an Oculus Rift where you're going to be playing like, you know, the AAA titles in 3D immersive surround sound. So where do you get Google Cardboard from and how easily is it to adapt to whatever make of phone you have? Uh, well, the um, you can buy them from you know, any number of manufacturers. I just got, because I just wanted to try it out, um, I got the cheapest one I could find, which cost me about £4 and shipped from China. I bought it off Amazon <laughs> And it came with literally nothing other than the the box itself. It didn't come with any instructions. Um, some of them come with an NFC tag or a QR code, which tells your phone how to configure itself for the viewer. It didn't have one of those. Um, but you can get more expensive ones. You can get them which are made of higher quality cardboard. You can get them which have um, head straps built in um, or with um, with better switches. So there is one switch on there, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, and um you can also get them for different sizes of phone i think the initial spec was for a phone up to five inches but you can now get them up to i think slightly above six inches with a slightly different design um and again yeah you could get them made of plastic and with stuff so they fit around your face better because i did find that after using it for a while i got a nice red mark on the bridge of my nose paper cuts on your face is never good is it yeah yeah, so the um the switch it has is interesting because there's not while you're holding it up to your face, you can't poke the touch screen. So what they've done is they've put um a magnet on the side and I believe that your phone's compass is basically distorted by the magnet and can tell when it's moving. So you can use that. It's like if you ever had as a kid one of those sort of um yeah, you had like a pair of binoculars and you looked through it and there was a picture of a lion and you pulled the lever on the side and it changed to a picture yeah, of a zebra or something like that. Things, yeah. Exactly. So it's yeah. like one of those switches on the side. It just slides up and down and you can use that. The way it's, it works in uh, in the demos is you basically you point your face at the control and then you flick the switch down and it selects that or you know it does whichever one action they've configured it to do although i found most of the third party apps they just use um like you look at a target for like two seconds and then it activates rather than actually using the switch Uh, so what martin was saying at the beginning about uh augmented reality well now we understand what the actual cardboard thing is what how would that work or why doesn't it work um I'm not sure it would work any better than just having your phone overlay something on. So, for example, if you were walking down the street and you wanted Google Maps directions overlaid on you know, the road in front of you, mm-hmm. you could hold up your phone and it would display it. But unless you had a 3D camera on your phone, it wouldn't be able to deliver two different images to to each eye for you to actually get a sort of augmented reality 3D effect. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm not really sure how any sort of augmented reality would really be achieved except for in 2D because it could just display the same picture to each eye. Oh, so you'd look a bit of an idiot. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's obviously got some lenses in it that actually do yes. the shuttering to deliver the 3D effect. Yes. Is it a bit like the cheap glasses you wear when you go and see a 3D movie? No, so those are polarised so that you're looking at one screen but you get different parts of the image. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas with this, you're actually looking at a different picture with each eye because your phone divides the screen in two right, right. and displays one picture for your left eye, one picture for your right. The lenses just focus so that they fill your whole vision, basically. And how convincing have you found that effect? Um, the effect is very convincing. The only problem is the um, the resolution it makes it less convincing and it also depends what you're watching if you're watching like a minecraft video it's not such a problem but if you're watching people it's much more noticeable but even so the the 3d-ness is very very convincing and very immersive but it's just you don't feel like you're there is there any opportunity to focus it at all because when i tried it very briefly with uh, a phone i found it was slightly out of focus and that just made it terrible and just headache inducing 
Ah, uh, right. I think, um, well, I, I found moving my head back and forth to the appropriate place was the only thing I could really do because, yeah, there's no adjustment on it. You just plop the lenses in and that's where they sit. But I guess because you're, um, you know, you get different cases which um, can, and you, as I, I mentioned earlier, you can have NFC tags or QR codes which might let your phone adjust to different stuff. But I think the idea is that the focal length is defined in the spec and so it's supposed to look okay with your phone that distance away from it, basically. Okay. That's as far as it goes. <laughs> um, one one thing that I did actually find really good was um, a game I played. There's um, a game called, um, it's called Ah, which is... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't quite catch a, that. What was, what's it called? <laughs> it's called Ah. I'll do it again. It's a base jumping sim, basically. <laughs> you you jump You jump off a building to a futuristic city and you have to avoid buildings and land in a a target that's that's a novel idea i've played that before where basically you have your phone facing the ground and you look down at your phone and you're seeing your drop through the buildings and you tilt your phone to control your fall and it's exactly that game but in 3d and it's really good so you're holding you're basically looking down at your phone with this on your face and you're basically moving your head side to side to control which way you're going and it works brilliantly. And again, the graphics were never that good. Uh, so it doesn't really matter too much. It's just the, the experience the of it. The sensation. Yeah. And is it Well, convinced- you don't quite have these sensors. You could, you could also put a fan on the ground blowing up the face. <laughs> and that would really, yeah. And is it convincing enough that you've lost your balance and fallen over? No, not oh, quite that's that much. That's, that's not, have not- you tried walking downstairs? <laughs> not really on my face no <laughs> oh, well, jump jump off the stairs and try and yeah no i don't think it, yeah you don't actually have to be falling for it to <laughs> <laughs> to be completely convincing yeah, yeah I it have, doesn't use the accelerometer as i well. have to say i didn't really know much about google cardboard but based on what you've said yeah. first of all it doesn't sound like an expensive proposition and it sounds exactly. like a bit of amusement yeah. And... The reason I bought it was to see if I wanted to buy a more expensive one, basically. And do you? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and a more expensive one basically being something that's fabricated not out of cardboard and has yeah. better or, lenses. Or out of better, basically something which is more comfortable on your face and maybe goes around your face more completely so it doesn't let light in or something. And is there and in... has proper head strap. And is there enough content in games to make it a, you know, a worthy purchase? maybe um it depends i mean if you were if you were also going to do something with it like maybe if you were a researcher who wanted to use it for prototyping or if you were a developer who wanted to play around with it then a more expensive one would probably be more justified um if you just want to use the the games which are there you know it depends on how much spare money you've got basically i think martin's getting at is it going to distract the kids for and and if oh, so yeah, for distract the kids not not yes. not so much distract, but you know, amusements definitely. I am one. Yeah, I mean, just as a as a you know, maybe you know, you'll use it, you know, four or five times and get some fun out of it, and then maybe pick it up once a month. I can certainly see myself doing that. You know, in the same way that if you have a new cat, you, you eventually buy them catnip, and you all sort of you know sit in a circle and watch the the cat wig out on catnip. Uh, for the first time <laughs> i'm just wondering what this might do to four and five year old children if you give I, yeah i don't think it's going to be a spectator it. sport watching someone <laughs> use this to be honest yeah. <laughs> okay so we've got a one minute update 60 second update okay yes, so we're also going far? to yeah we mentioned last week that that martin and laura were going to go cold turkey and try and use only their ubuntu phones for a month so this is our midway point and we're just going to check in with each of them and see how they're getting on so laura how's it going uh, I'm probably using them about half and half, okay. just because there's things on my Android phone that I can't do on Ubuntu phone. Right. However, the last few days I've kind of got worse at using the Ubuntu phone, so I put out a request on Twitter for use cases that you want me to test. So anybody's got use cases you want me to test, and I will try it this weekend. Cool. Um, especially, don't please don't ask me again to do syncing <laughs> without using Google, because I, I will do it, I promise. Um and uh oh tethering and things like that. What about some apps that you want to use or and find alternatives for that kind of thing? Things that normal users want, might want to do. Cool. And or how can they disrespect. should should they email the show or should they? Ideally tweet. You tweet or? Ideally tweet me. But, okay. Um, email if they want. 
Cool. And they'll find your Twitter address on the uh, show notes, won't they? Yeah, yeah, if they have a look at the Ubuntu podcast yeah. account. Yeah, cool. Uh, Martin, how's it been going for you? Uh, well, I'm particularly enjoying tinkering around with the SDK and, you know, creating little apps. I've not released all of them, but I'm having fun with that and having fun learning it. And I'd say that's the best thing about the Ubuntu Touch Phone. It's very easy to get started with development and you can very quickly uh, uh, get more sophisticated with what you want to do. So that's good in terms of actually using it i've had a number two weekends where i absolutely depended on my phone for birthday party arrangements and sadly the ubuntu phone got left behind on those two occasions the the martin wimpress pirate service Uh, yes yes yeah yeah. captain banana trumpet um is uh, (laughs) (laughs) um so the the biggest shortfall I've found with Ubuntu Touch, and I know that Alan has said this is something that is actively being worked on and will hopefully be delivered in an update in August, but you can't copy and paste between web apps. And given mm. that Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus are all developed as web apps, and I need to be able to paste between those things to share messages about the place... I can't do that. And that is Ah. the biggest shortcoming that I've run into. And this is because of the, you know, the isolation that exists with, um, with Mia and what have you. So that's the biggest stumbling block I've run into. Um, and it, my phone, uh, this isn't borne out by what I've read, but my phone, I'm not sure if it's actually rebooting or if Mia is just, uh, crashing and restarting on itself, but I haven't been able to pin down a reliable test case. But if I swipe in or down from time to time, just I get the Ubuntu spinning logo and it resets itself. And I'm not quite sure what's All going right. on there. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, I know I there's an update, I know there's an there. update due this week. Uh, so yeah. I'm hoping that maybe some of these things will be addressed. Um, cool. But as a development device and learning the platform, I'm very much enjoying that aspect of it. Excellent. Cool. Right. And I think that's all for the segment. And now it's time for some gooey love. I think that's been uh, spelt incorrectly there, folks. <laughs> no, sorry, gooey love. And this, <laughs> not, uh, not too bad, comes, this one comes from Rich T, uh, biscuit joke uh, inserted there. <laughs> uh, and he says, today I stumbled onto a neat method of introducing Android and iOS style app drawers to the launcher. It's called Launcher Folders and uh, can be found at the link that we'll put in the show notes. And to install, you simply add the PPA. Um, and if you're on the bleeding edge, I tried this in 1504 and it didn't work. Uh, you have to change in software and updates, go to other software and change the distro name. I changed it to trusty and it worked. And then just sudo up, get update, sudo up, get install unity dash launcher dash folders. And then you launch the application from the HUD and it's got a nice bright yellow tux icon so you can't miss it. And then you, from the HUD, you, from the HUD, you drag and drop the applications that you want into each particular app drawer. And then you save that and add it to the launcher. Or indeed, um, you can copy it from, um, your home directory dot local slash share slash applications. Uh, you just copy that onto your desktop and then you've got it there. I mean, t- to me, it feels more like, um, less like an app drawer and more like app folders on Android and iOS where you click that and then it expands and then you've got the various yeah. um, applications that you want to launch. Mm-hmm. So you could um, you could more efficiently use the, the launcher, I think, in Unity nice. if you were so inclined. So you could have, say, all of your LibreOffice um, launchers in one. Yeah, that's a good example, yeah. Cool. I like the sound of that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Rich also sent us a veritable catalogue of other GUI tips, which we don't have time to cover, but... Um, We'll add them to the show notes. Cool. So Thanks, Rich. Should we have some feedback then? Okay. Let's do that. So 
So we've got some feedback from Stephen B, who emailed in after hearing our initial impressions of the MX4 and E5 Ubuntu phones on the last show. I can see how Scopes provide hooks to advertising and so on, but at this stage it's developers who are buying the devices. The privacy community may find the platform leaks a lot of information. I'd prefer gimmicks via I'd prefer fewer gimmicks via limited sales and walls. BQ nearly lost a sale because I considered buying a second Nexus 4, as Martin W did, to run the latest version. How come how will the development team cope as more hardware becomes available? The omission of features such as tethering is disappointing. From the outside, there's a lot of effort on redesigning calicas, calendars and calculators. He says, of the BQ4, good points. Battery life is good. Dual SIM support. Micro SD slot is useful. Not so good. Camera quality. And he senses the memory slash processor has its limits. The MX4, the purchasing process is bizarre. I got an invite to buy the phone, but the specs pricing are short of the competitors in some areas. E.g. one plus one phone has 64 gig of storage for the same price. Also, the MX4 has no means to expand storage capacity. Martin? That's true. I'm beginning to wonder if I uh, have had my notes hacked by Stephen B because this is <laughs> remarkably, <laughs> remarkably similar. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, the lack of tethering is something that I've really missed. And yes, right. there does seem to be a focus on redesigning and finessing the look and feel of some of the apps rather than, you know, adding functionality. But yeah, I, I particularly like the dual SIM and the micro SD access is great. Camera quality. Um, yeah. So I was, I was saying the camera quality was quite good. And what I found is if, um, if you've been out in some of the good weather we've had in the UK recently in the sunlight, it does take good pictures, but in anything other than really good, you know, clear sunshine, it's not so great. It looks a little bit uh, oversaturated, but sharpened. Uh, just a few final points um, from Stephen. He says, apart from all that, I am managing to use the BQ 4.5 as my main phone as I don't rely on many apps and the terminal is excellent. Looking forward to the converged device in the autumn. I thought the E6 might have been a good candidate for this. Finally, I noticed an interview with Microsoft representative claiming the Surface 3 tablet could dual boot Ubuntu. Is this true? There are lots of reports with major problems trying to run Ubuntu on Bay Trail powered devices. Uh, I've, I've not heard any of this. No. no. I mean, I have seen Surface devices running uh, Ubuntu just off a USB stick, but um, yeah, I don't know if that was the Surface 3. Neil McLaren emailed in after installing Ubuntu Mate on his iMac. Well, everything works just fine on the Mac, which is now configured as a dual boot system running Mac OS X and Ubuntu Mate 1404 LTS. It's 27-inch mid-2011 iMac with lots of RAM and plenty of disk space, and he resized the disk utility under OS X to give a 128-gig fat partition on which Linux is now installed. 120 gig fat partition. Wow. Okay. That was brave. <laughs> um, and, uh, he's used refit, uh, to do the, uh, the dual booting between, uh, Mac and Linux. Uh, refit did break after a kernel update, but he says it wasn't too difficult to resolve that. Uh, all his hardware is working out of the box. He can even record using his, uh, focus, focus right. Is that focus right? Scarlet Solar audio interface using the Shure SM58 mic or without having to download anything other than Audacity. Um, oh, I'm blushing now. Overall, the system works well and I'm impressed with it. <laughs> however, yeah, there's always a however, <laughs> isn't there? <laughs> however, <laughs> to be honest, I have to say that I've not tested thoroughly enough to comment on anything more than uh, the ease of use, which I managed to get the system up and running. Uh, hats off to the Ubuntu Mate team, as I can see life for my Mac if and when Apple stops supporting it. You've even got a version that runs in PowerPC too. Yes, this is all true. Uh, and uh, Ubuntu Mate is converting uh, Mac users to Linux one user at a time. Um, welcome to the club, Neil. I'm glad I'm glad that's working out for you. It makes me very happy. Thanks for writing into the Ubuntu Marketer podcast. <laughs> <laughs> John Spriggs tweeted after hearing Joe's comments about password managers a few weeks ago. Been using and recommending KeePass on Android, Linux, and Windows for years. It's floss on mono, but with an open and widely implemented standard format too. KeePass X native Linux version or KeePass 2 mono on Linux. And that's something that I have added to my massive to-do list, but who knows when I'll finally get round to it. 
to give it yeah. that. I should also say about John Spriggs is he's very kindly lent me an Ubuntu phone so that I can play around with it and develop an app. So thanks, oh, John. He really is a thanks, nice guy. Thanks, John. Yeah. John he is really a, is. John, he, they yeah. call him John the nice guy for a reason. Yeah, yeah. And he, he's also responsible for putting together the um, the uh, Unconference app for OddCamp as well, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Yes, except, yes. Or, yeah, last year it didn't go so well because and, yeah, he was uh, otherwise engaged having children. Yeah, well, so, I think uh, we can forgive him that we, inconvenience. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but yes, so uh, we might have that up and running again this year if he's got the time or the patience. <laughs> <laughs> well that's the end of the feedback i think isn't it yep. yes well that's it for episode 20 it says here we'll be back next week but i don't suppose i will but they'll be back next week <laughs> and they'll have more news comment and discussion cool i think we'd better wrap up quickly yeah yeah all thank- right then, everyone. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks once again, Joe, for <laughs> for standing in. Indeed. Yes. See you later. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Stop.